Hear the word of the Lord. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works to all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the due glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the peoples. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord comes. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Good morning. It is good to be again in the house of our God. Welcome to Frankfurt United Methodist Church. All right, a few announcements this morning, of course. We'll be singing at 3 o'clock this afternoon here, so I invite somebody to come and join and see um, the beautiful music because it really is a pretty cantata. And then we'll be singing over at Clarksburg at 7 tonight. Christmas Eve services is 6. And then on Sunday, we will have regular worship on Christmas Day. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Uh, I just want to let everyone know, if you can't make it on Christmas Day, I completely understand this is a free pass. If you, if you have other things you need to be doing that day, um, you know, there's, there's no animosity, there's no hard feelings. But we are going to be here, so if you are ha- if you happen to be free that day, um, we love to see you. All right. I brought flowers this morning in there for each of you ladies. It's a Christmas gift from Brent and I to you. I ask that you return the vases to me so I keep the set together. But take them home and enjoy them. Um, we had them on the tables last night at Brent's mother's birthday party. She turned 80 this week. So um, these are flowers from us. The word this week is patience. Think about that amendment. Waiting for Christmas is like waiting for a star to fall. We know it will come, streaking across our lives with a promise of light, but we can grow weary from the advent strain of waiting. This author says, in the early years of her marriage, she and her husband lived near an ocean and their favorite winter tradition was to pack a picnic dinner and head to the beach so that they could <clears throat> be there as the day turned to night. Wrapped in the winter coats, hats, and gloves, they sat in an old sleeping bag and began to watch the sky as the stars made their light known. First one, then another, then a third would come into focus. And finally, the constellation completed our attention. It was only the holy sight to behold. Once the frozen background of the winter night sky darkened just enough, we began to watch for falling stars. Have you ever watched for a falling star and how hard it is to see them? And one person will see it and say something and by the time you look, it's gone. And so she talks about how impatient she was. Um, because she kept missing the, the, not the stars as they were streaked across the, the sky. <clears throat> With practice, I learned that if I just kept looking patiently, I would almost find a falling star. Over time, I learned from friends that living in the, by the ocean longer than I had... <clears throat> Then that the likelihood of finding a falling star was greater in certain seasons of the year, and particularly this time of light. I learned that if I lay down and wait longer and watch better, 
I had to let patience, desire, and practice teach me to be present in what was to come. So it is with the advent and advent in patience. As we begin to watch impatiently for the light of Christmas, we have been given this stretch of time and space of advent. Here we are invited to grow in patience and to position our lives so that we do not miss what God is doing in the wide world. May we slow down, spread out our whole lives before God, and practice patience, watching for where the light of God is falling. May we catch a glimpse of the holy light of, our, of the lives and places in the world that need our attention and are illuminated by God's radiance. So as we draw near, may we all settle into Advent with a deep desire to see and attend to the matters of God. May all the glory be to God. All right, we're ready for um, the Advent lighting. Okay, yeah, there it is. <clears throat> uh, now let's uh, turn our attention to our praise song, number 349, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Um, and then our opening hymn, number 245, The First Noel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Just a quick observation while we're turning pages. I, I still think of that song as a new hymn. It is a hundred years old today. Thank you. Uh, now we'll turn to our responsive reading, which is correct on the slide, but not in the bulletin. My apologies. <clears throat> I'll read the dark print. You can read the red. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. <clears throat> Give to him glorious praise. Say to God. So great is your power that your enemies come Cringing to you. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm not sure I've ever read the word cringing in a scripture before. I, I apologize. Uh, and now we'll have special music by June. Well, June and my friend, <laughs> who I called upon as soon as she walked in the door and she said yes. But one thing we need to make sure they they stand. Oh. Okay. And who are you, young lady? This is Savannah Robinson. She hails from OU Athens these past couple of years, but. When she comes home, we will let her share with us. So, so glad to have you back. Um, we are going to do an organ piano duet. Now thank we all our God. Technical difficulties in lost their keys. <laughs> Oh. 
with a little silent moan. Okay, uh, now we come to our prayer and share time. If anyone has any prayer requests or praise reports, let us make them known. Um, first off, I, I heard uh, this morning Roy told me that Phyllis fell and broke her, her thigh uh, this week. And um, so we want to put her right at the top of our list. Spent the evening and had a wonderful birthday party for us. So That's we great. Are very blessed. Hallelujah. 
Thank you. Yes. Good, good. Thank you for the update. Yes, Pam. Teresa is better, but I convinced her when she talks, she starts talking. Stay home and get the day. Okay, great. We will pray for Teresa and David. Any others? Yes. Absolutely. We'll keep, we'll keep Lee on our prayer list. I, I would like to ask for your prayers on, on Thursday of this week. Uh, okay. Oh, that's impossible. Your voice is amazing. But we will pray for Karen. Any other prayer requests or prayer reports? Yes. Oh my. It's not only in the high school, in the elementary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of sick. And a lot of things going on here in the next couple of weeks. So I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll say a special prayer for our schools and the students in them. Any others? If not... Let's go before the throne. Blessed and holy Lord, in this, your Advent season, we come before you. Lord, we know that you hear our prayers. We know that you stoop to listen to our prayers, that you are ever more eager to hear than we are to pray. And so, Lord, we come knowing that you listen, knowing, Lord, that we are heard by the most important being in all of existence, that the president won't hear us, that the mayor probably won't hear us, that Our senators won't hear us, but that the God of the universe is eager to listen. Father, in that we take comfort. In that we find hope and peace and joy. Lord, you are good. You are holy and true and righteous and just and might and pure and wise and mighty and true. You are all good things, Father, and all good things flow from you. You are light, and in you there is no darkness. You are life, and in you there is no death. You are truth, and in you there is no falsehood. You are holy, you are mighty, and you are God. Blessed Father, we have sinned against heaven and against our fellow men. We have done those things we should not have done, and we have left undone those things we should have accomplished. And there is within us no peace. But blessed Lord, you tell us in your holy scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just, that you will forgive us of our trespasses and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
And so, Father, in these next few moments, in this holy place, in the privacy of our own hearts, we make our confession before you. And so, blessed Lord, in in our confession and through the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Anointed One, we are forgiven. And it is truly marvelous in our sight. And now, Father, as a righteous and a redeemed people, we stand before you. We lift before you, Father, those we have spoken this morning. We lift also before you those we have kept hidden in our hearts. Father, we ask that you would be with Phyllis, with Teresa, and with David. Father, we ask your hand of blessing and healing on Lee and on Karen. Father, we ask your guidance, your blessing, your wisdom on our schools, the students and teachers, the staff and administrators. Lord, we ask that you would continue to empower them for the good work to which you have called them, Lord, we ask that you would protect them from the sickness and the disease that's going around. Father, we ask your blessing on our nation and its leaders in this tumultuous time. Lord, we ask that you would give them wisdom and strength and courage to do what is right in your eyes. That our nation might once again be a shining city set upon a hill proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark and hurting world. Finally, Father, we ask your blessing on Frankfurt United Methodist Church, on the building, on the premises, on the people in the pews, Lord. We ask that you would use us for your great purpose, that the word of the Lord would truly go forth from this place for the saving of souls for Jesus Christ. And now, Father, as we go into the remainder of our service, we ask that you would be with us. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and loose our tongues and soften our hearts, that we might know and speak and hear the wonderful, holy truths of your scripture. These things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Anointed One, who himself has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, This time I'd like to ask a couple of ushers to come forward, please.
Thank you. You may be seated. <sighs> okay. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> let's open our Bibles, please, to Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1. Uh, if you stuck your bulletin in your Bible last week, we're in the same book. Not, not the next chapter, but uh, fairly close. Isaiah 35 and 1. Uh, uh, once you've found the place, or if you're going to follow along on the screen, if you're able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Isaiah 35 and 1. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, fear not. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And, the, and then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For the waters break forth in the wilderness, and the streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there. It shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there." And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness with joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed and holy Lord, in these next few moments, may you take these poor, humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your meaning. May you teach your people the message you would have them to hear that above all things, Father, your name would be glorified. In Christ's holy name, amen. Thank you. I was struck when I was preparing this message, reading through that passage, how much of those miracles Jesus performed and how much that passage, that, that chapter from Isaiah, must have been going through the heads of all who saw him. The, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame leap for joy. Uh, it was truly a, a messianic prophecy. Now, this morning is the third Sunday in our Advent journey. This morning, along with the candles of hope and peace, we light the pink candle of joy. Joy is a theme commonly found in the Scriptures. The English word appears 203 times throughout the ESV and about that many times in other translations. And, being who I am, I went to the dictionary to find a proper, official definition of joy. But what I found is that it's such a simple word. There's nothing to be learned about it from the dictionary. It is what it is. It's a happy feeling. It's enduring gladness. Everyone knows what joy is. Means And when that tool failed me, I decided to look it up in the Bible, surprise, surprise, and find out what the Bible has to say about it. Now, I often speak of the law of first mention. That is, wherever a concept is found first in the Bible, 
is the best way to understand how that concept is used by Scripture. I know that wasn't a real sentence. I'm sorry. It got the meaning across. The first usage of a word or an idea in the Bible explains what the Bible means by that idea or word. For example, the first place we hear the word love in the Bible is in conjunction with the binding of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham prophetically acts out the crucifixion of Christ a full 2,000 years before it happens. This shows us very clearly what the Bible means by love and prophesies the greatest love when Christ comes and gives himself for us, as Jesus said in John 15 and 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So where do we find the first usage of the word joy in the Bible? Remember I said it had 203 uses in the ESV and spread out over 66 books. You'd expect to find a good number of uses in each book. But the Bible holds off on talking about joy until Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 16, in the fifth book of the Bible. I marveled, I had marveled before that God had waited a full 22 chapters to talk about love, to give us a glimpse of that word and, and its, its central theme, because it is the central theme of the Bible. But here... God waits five whole books to tell us about the word joy. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 13, You shall keep the feast of booths seven days, when you have gathered in the product of your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you, shall, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall, you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all, that, in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. This is one of the six yearly feasts of Israel. This one happens in the fall after the harvest is brought in. Israel is about the same latitude as we are. If you open your phone, you take out the weather app, and you just type in Jerusalem, you can flip back and forth between Frankfurt and Jerusalem and find out that we're usually within 5 or 10 degrees of one another. The climate is much the same, except that they get far less pre precipitation than we do. I misspelled that when I typed it the first time, too, so I, I'm glad I, I, I messed it up when I was speaking. Their, their growing season is similar to ours. It's shorter, um, but they use far different irrigation methods. Brent and I have had long conversations about this. But that's beside the point. The Feast of Booths happens in the fall, shortly after the end of the standard harvest period. And for seven days, the people of Israel are commanded to build a booth or a tent outside their homes to live in them for the week. And they're not told why, but they are commanded to be joyful. I spoke to a Jewish friend of mine about this, and this is one of those things he specifically mentioned about the Feast of Booths, that they are told to be joyful. It's kind of a weird custom, but it reminds them of the time they wandered in the desert under Moses, after they had been freed from captivity in Egypt. The Lord mentions this in Leviticus 23 and 43, in the first instruction on the Feast of Booths. We read, "...that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God." But the Leviticus passage doesn't mention joy. It gives precise instructions on exactly when the feast is to take place, the 15th day of the seventh month. Remember that, that the ancient people, ancient Hebrew people did not use the Julian calendar that we now know. And that's a whole other teaching. And while it's fascinating and has some really in interesting implications, I'm not sure we'll get to it in a sermon. Uh, if I really want to put people to sleep, that's what I'll teach on. But... Uh, it may be a Bible study someday. 
So God waits until the fifth book of the Bible to mention the concept of joy, and that should cause us to ask, why? What is it about the Feast of Booths that we should associate with joy? Oh, the harvest. Well, kind of, but I mean, there's a harvest in the spring. There's the barley harvest in the spring. And barley is a major food group in Israel, but they're not commanded to be joyful about that. What is it about the Feast of Booths that we should associate with joy? And why, on this third Sunday of Advent, is AJ talking about one of the Feasts of Israel instead of giving us a joyful sermon about joy? If we turn to the Gospel of John, we find that John gives a very different story of the origin of Jesus. Matthew and Luke both give stories of the Messiah's birth. They give genealogies. Matthew beginning with Abraham and showing us the Jewishness of Jesus because Abraham was the first Jew. Luke beginning with Adam and showing us the humanity of Jesus because Matthew was a Levite from the tribe of priests, the the priestly tribe of Levi, and was mostly concerned with presenting Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the coming Messiah. Luke, on the other hand, was a physician. His concern was on the humanity of Jesus. And searching this out, I decided to ask Rabbi Google, was Luke Jewish? And Rabbi Google gave me all kinds of different answers. But they did point to scriptures. And so I started looking at these scriptures to find the answer to my question, because that's more reliable than Rabbi Google anyway. And in his letter to the church at Colossia, Paul writes, beginning at, first, uh, at Colossians 4 and verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, um, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Here he names three men and calls them of the circumcision, which is a common way of referring to those who are circumcised, or at that time, Jewish men. But a few verses later... That was verse 11. In verse 14, Paul says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Luke was, of course, among Paul's fellow workers, since he is sending greetings, and Paul sends greetings for Aristarchus and Justice and Luke, but Paul does not count Luke among the men of the circumcision. This strongly implies that Luke was not ethnically Jewish and may have been a, he may have been a late convert to Judaism or he may even have simply been a Gentile Christian. And please forgive me chasing this little rabbit trail, but it, it is just exciting to me that one of the four Gospels may have been written by a Gentile believer like you and I. Now, to get back on track, Matthew and Luke are written with a genealogy of Jesus, starting with Abraham and Adam, respectively. Mark was a servant. The theme of his gospel is that Jesus is also a servant. And because of this, Mark jumps right into the action, telling us immediately what Jesus does rather than where Jesus comes from. Mark was likely written somewhere between 40 and 45 AD, within 10 years of Jesus' death and resurrection. That is the sound of life, and I love to hear that in my sanctuary. That is, that is a wonderful sound. I know she's not happy, and I understand Mama wants to do something about it, but we don't hear that sound nearly often enough in our sanctuary. Matthew and Luke, some scholars think, were written about 10 years later, around 55 AD. And immediately, these three Gospels were accepted by the church as authoritative. We can get more into why that is another time, but for now, it's enough to say that they were widely circulated almost immediately. People began to copy them and disseminate the copies all over the world. But the Gospel of John was written around 95 AD, a full 25 years after the fall of the temple and the sacking of Jerusalem by the Roman general Titus Vespasian. 
Historians like Dr. Bart Ehrman will say, oh, 95 AD, that was so long after, no one could possibly have still been alive after 62 years of Jesus' death. Now, it's assuming that John, the beloved, was, was 20 years old when he started traveling with Jesus, that would put him at 82 years old, 82, 83 years old at the time of the writing of his gospel. I won't ask for a show of hands how many people are or know someone who is 82 years old. <clears throat> but while the first three gospels share a lot of details, thus earning them the name the synoptic gospels, synoptic uh, meaning of similar appearance, John's gospel is very different. Other than the resurrection, only one miracle appears in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. Much of what John writes does not appear in the first three Gospels. Why? Because, quite simply, those Gospels were already in wide circulation. John had no need to retell those stories. It, it, everybody knew those stories. Everybody had a copy of them, and I'm serious about this. We have 800 ancient copies of the works of Plato. 800! So many! Textual scholars of Plato are proud to be able to say, look, we have 800 copies of Plato's works. We can be absolutely certain what he said. Because where there is a scribal error in one, we have 799 others to correct that scribal error. Dearly beloved, we have 7,000 ancient copies of the New Testament. In terms of ancient books, Plato comes in second. There's nobody higher than Plato except the New Testament. And, and, and just because I'm, I'm here now, we may as well go through with this. How big are each of those copies? Each of those 7,000 copies averages, that doesn't mean they all have, but they average 450 pages. 450 pages. If the people who study Plato can be so absolutely certain what Plato originally wrote from their 800 copies, I think we're doing okay. Matthew, Mark, or Matthew, Luke, and John felt the need, uh, I'm sorry, like Matthew and Luke, John felt the need to tell his readers where Jesus came from. But he didn't want to recount Matthew's genealogy. He didn't want to recount Luke's genealogy, and those genealogies are different. They're the same up to Solomon, and then they split. One goes through one of Solomon's, others, uh, one of Solomon's sons, and one goes through another. John didn't want to recount that genealogy because there was nothing more to tell. But John still wants to tell his readers where Jesus comes from, and so he writes in his prologue, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John gives us a unique genealogy. He gives us the genealogy of the pre-existent Christ. Jesus was already in the beginning. He was the creator. He was with God. He was God. And then John steps away from this genealogy for a moment and tells us about the prophet spoken of, of by Isaiah who would, quote, make straight a highway for our God. Two quick paragraphs about John the Baptist and then the gospel writer gives us verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This Greek word that the ESV here translates as dwelt 
is only ever used in the New Testament by John. One time here in the Gospel and four times in the Revelation. And it means to dwell or to live in or to take up residence. It's sometimes used in reference to the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. See where I was going with this? I told you it would come back. Which Moses speaks of in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And here's where everything comes together. The Jews are told to be joyous during the Feast of Booths, but are not told why. John tells us why. He says that Jesus tabernacled among us. Many believe that John, uh, myself included, believe that John is here alluding to the possibility that Jesus was born during the Feast of Booths. And that all the way back in Deuteronomy, God was telling the people to be joyous because they were more than 2,000 years ahead of time, dearly beloved, celebrating the birth of Christ. That's the reason for joy. Christ has come. Just as with Abraham, the meaning of love is revealed in sacrifice. With Moses, the meaning of joy is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were lost without hope at war with God. In our sinful rebellion against him, we were condemned to live and to die apart from him. But Jesus comes, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. He comes to give himself in a perfect expression of love, to give us hope and to make peace between us and the God of the universe. As Paul says, beginning in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you, to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God in him, dearly beloved. In Christ we have hope, hope that we are not lost, hope that we are not condemned, hope that we can be reconciled to our Father and Creator. In him, dearly beloved, we have peace, peace with God, an end to our rebellion, an end to death and suffering, an end to despair. In him and in him alone we find true and lasting joy being freed from death and released into that glorious goodness of eternal life in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. Amen. Let's bow our hearts. Blessed Lord, on this joyous Advent morning, we give you thanks. We worship you, Lord. We praise you. We adore you. We gaze in awe and wonder at your mighty works, on the works of your hands, on the salvation that you have brought us. And we stand in awe. In you, Lord, we find our hope. In you, we find our peace. In you, And in you alone, Lord, we find joy. In Christ's name, amen. Now let us turn in our hymnals, please, to our closing hymn, number 249. There's a song in the air. 
Uh, I don't know this one, so sing loud. So I knew the tune, I didn't know the song. <clears throat> the Advent wreath is one of my favorite things of the Christmas season. It reminds us that Christmas is not just presents. So often that's what it is to us. It's just a tree and some presents and a meal at grandma's that we don't want to go to. But with the Advent wreath, we focus on hope and peace and joy. And next week, we will finish Advent. Can you believe that? We're going to finish Advent next week by lighting the candle of love, the central theme of the Bible. So rather than a regular uh, blessing, let me just wish you all a very merry Christmas, a very happy Advent. Let me wish you all the hope that comes with knowing Christ Jesus, the peace of his salvation, and the joy that floods your heart forever. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.